So I met Emma's revolution um, at the Parliament of World Religions in 2015 in Salt Lake City and uh, had the great pleasure of then interviewing them on uh, what I had a radio show at the time called Soul Stream. And I also met these um, three men, um, the interfaith amigos. Uh, <laughs> it's a, um, Muslim imam, a Jewish rabbi, and a Christian pastor. I always feel like I'm beginning a joke when I, <laughs> when I put those three together. But, and they are full of joy, so I guess that's not too far from the truth. And these three men, are, um, they've become friends, and then they kind of travel around together and present together what they found as uh, becoming friends across these different religions, and they're, they're you know, really steeped in their own religions. And I was especially intrigued with some of the things that Imam Jamal shared, who's the Muslim Imam. He said that it had actually, that interfaith relationship with the other two men um, had strengthened and deepened him, him, made him a better Muslim. And he also said that, I, I had asked him, you know, what is jihad? I mean, let's put this thing to rest. What is this thing called jihad, you know? He said, oh, holy jihad. He said, that's like the battle, the internal battle of lessening the ego and empowering the spirit. I thought, boy, that sounds like familiar theology. <laughs> we have much more in common than we think. Always, always. If we just knew that one thing and just held that one belief everywhere we went, I have much more in common with the person across from me or the person I'm thinking is so different from me or those people, whoever those people are, us and them, you know, when we get into that. If we just thought for a moment, wait a second, I have much more in common with this individual than I think. So could I just look for the common ground? What if we all did that? It's, I, I, would, I would do one of these, but you know, <laughs> then it might hurt this. Well, I just did, but. <laughs> And it didn't hurt, that's good news. <laughs> so so this, this informing each other, like the Interfaith Amigos did, this informing ourselves, making friends with the other, the one who we don't know as much about, or the thing that we don't know so much about, is a key to the practice of inclusivity, which really leads us back to the base belief and understanding and memory of the truth that we know in spirit, that we are all one and one with the one. Of course, that is all one, right? <laughs> And back to that oneness, that grounding of oneness. That's where we return. That's that place in that beautiful song in the meditation where, you know, that place where earth and sky touch, where we are born and where we die. But it's also what we carry with us in our hearts throughout every step of this beautiful life is that, that base knowing that we are all connected in this way, connected through love. How many of you have ever felt like an other? Yeah. And if you didn't raise your hand, you probably have and maybe don't realize it or didn't feel like raising your hand. Either way, this is fine. <laughs> All are welcome here. <laughs> so I want to just give you um, a, a moment to just drop into your hearts and maybe close your eyes if you want and just see if you can get in touch with an experience a time when you have felt like an other. Just allow yourself to feel the feeling of being the other in this situation. And you might want to return to this meditation if nothing came at this time. But any of you have an experience? Anybody have a feeling that came with being an other, how that felt? You can just say it out loud if there was a feeling. Rejected. 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 Alone. 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 Embarrassed. Embarrassed. Uncomfortable. Sad. Sad. Tightening. Tightening, like a tightening in your body. Yeah. Scared. Shut down. Okay. Challenged. Challenged. Dismissed. Dismissed. 
wandering and searching. Well, as there was like a simultaneous <laughs> three people over here. What was that? Different. Different. There was someone else here? Unworthy. Unworthy. Wow. Can you feel that? What it feels like to be an other. And when we can remember what that feels like, remember the golden rule, it's in all the religions, do unto others as you would have done unto you. When we remember that touchstone of what it feels like to be an other, we won't ever otherize again. Because that's not what we want to bring into the world, is it? No. <laughs> it's not what we're about at all. So um, we've been learning alongside uh, Sharif, uh, with Sharif Abdullah's work, uh, Dr. Sharif Abdullah, through the class that I just finished, Practicing Inclusivity. It's actually called Toward Oneness, the Practice of Inclusivity. And so the idea that we're coming toward that experience of that knowing that we have, that underpinning of oneness, but it takes practice, right? It takes practice to get it. It takes the celebration of diversity and the practice of inclusivity to get us there. And so in many ways, the work and the class was, was real and sometimes the conversations were difficult, but we moved through it because we were all as a whole committed to really growing and learning and, and, and shining a light on this shadow of other. That's the series we're in, by the way the Illumined Shadow series. This is our third week. So the first week we looked at the shadow of anxiety and moved it to peace. And then last week, the shadow of lack, moving it to abundance. These are shadows for ourselves personally, but very much collectively in our world. And then today, that shadow of other, moving it to oneness. So of course, this is a picture of Sharif. And Sharif um, was kind of patched into our class through Zoom and, and did a little webinar with us. And um, one of the, he told us a bunch of stories, but one of the stories he told me really moved me that I want to share with you today. He, um, he's been much of his career doing this work of inclusivity, and he's done it all over the world. He's one of the most multicultural guys I've ever met. And he was telling this story about a time he was presenting at an inclusivity conference in Russia. And he, um, he f went out the door and forgot to comb his hair. And so he went back and he just, you know, popped in the hotel room and had the door still open in the hallway as he was combing his hair. And this Russian guy comes by, who he had had a little bit of interaction with in some of the sessions, and says, what are you doing? And he said, I'm combing my hair. And the guy said, you don't have any hair. <laughs> <laughs> he said at the time, actually, he did have hair, <laughs> more hair. He said, well, no, I have hair. It's just short. It's close to my head. He goes, but I want it to all go the same direction. <laughs> And so then the man says, can I touch your hair? And he's thinking, kind of weird, <laughs> but OK. So the man begins to touch his hair and his beard. And another man comes down the hallway and says, can I touch your hair? <laughs> and so he's got two different people touching his hair and his beard, one on each side. Another man comes by. This is a true story. And says, can I touch your skin? And he asks us in the class, how many of you know that black and white and brown skin is just skin? It all feels the same. <laughs> but he said, I realize that these people had maybe never interacted with somebody of African descent. And so he said, I was of two minds with this. You know, on one hand, this is really weird and bizarre. And on the other hand, I have curiosities about people who are really different from me. And so this is a cultural learning experience. So the other guy is now touching his skin. And before you know it, there's a line down the hall. <laughs> and he just went with it, you know? And this story is, for me, like, so moving. Like when I was thinking about this morning, I actually was crying before I came this morning. I thought, told Brenly, I was like, I don't know if I'm gonna get through this story, but you know, if you if you if you like get into it enough, you know, you, you get a hold of yourself a bit. <laughs> but I guess what's so moving for me is that it, it's so tender and so vulnerable and so open and so like, here's a guy who's been 
probably discriminated against all of his life because of his skin and his hair. And he's just opening himself up to a whole culture to say, go ahead, touch me. <laughs> Experience this. Experience the difference so we can connect heart to heart. Build that bridge and let the shadow of otherness be illumined so that we can experience the truth of oneness that is always there. When I, I've always cared a lot about equality. I'm sure you have too. Um, and I remember when I was a young woman in my 20s, you know, I, just, I wanted to change the world. Anybody have that kind of zeal when you were in your 20s? I talk to my niece now and I'm like, okay, take a breath. Slow down. I just see mini me there, you know. <laughs> but, you know, it's like we get that zeal. We just see where there's inequalities and we want equality. We see where there's pain and we want to bring hope and, and compassion and kindness. You know, that, that's just who we are. That's how we're wired. And I was praying about this, and along came this, I just happened to hear this senator, he was a, a senator at the time in New Jersey. Before, before that, he was a New York Knicks professional basketball player. His name is Bill Bradley. And he said, um, if you want to um, really make a difference in, in terms of race, and it could be any kind of otherness, he said, befriend somebody of the other. He basically said, befriend somebody of another race. He was talking about it in that context. And so I kind of just cast that as a prayer. You know, I had lots of acquaintances and coworkers. I, I was in a world of diversity. I was living in Chicago. I worked in a very diverse place. We served Chicago public school teachers, very diverse clientele. So I was experiencing diversity around my life, but I didn't have really close friends that were of different backgrounds. And so I just kind of cast that out there as that really made a lot of sense to me when I heard what he said. And I thought, well, that's something I can do. I don't really know how to sign up for all the activism, and I'm not even sure that that's totally my thing, but, but this is something I could do. And so, I'll, you know, as spirit would have it, things were quite different than what I thought they would be, and life started to unfold in a whole new kind of direction for me. And suddenly, I became an other in a way that I had never been before, because I fell in love with a woman, and she was black. And boy, did I get a schooling in privilege, in otherness, in everything that I had asked for. You know, we never, you know, be careful what you pray for, right? <laughs> it's not always easy, but it's good. And it really helps us learn and grow in all kinds of ways. I mean, I learned things that I would have not otherwise known. And in some of it, you know, when you love somebody deeply, you hear it in a whole different way, right? You hear the stories in a whole different way. So when she told me about she and her sisters being followed around in the stores, the same stores I had shopped in, I'd never had a shopkeeper or an employee follow me around. It's like, really? I mean, I just, I was that green. It was just like, what? How could that be? How could that have happened to you? Why would that have happened to you, you know? Or, or I wasn't afraid to, you know, drive a few miles over the speed limit. I didn't think, you know, I was going to get stopped for a ticket or far worse. And so I would, you know, we would, you know, we used humor a lot. We'd say, your people, you know, a guy walking in the, in the winter in shorts and a down jacket. I mean, that's a common sight in California, but in Chicago it was less common. <laughs> She'd say, your people, you know. <laughs> and one time, you know, she also, you know, just coming into my family, right? So in my family, she would use humor. So she would come and visit and and this was all new for my parents. I mean, my poor parents had to deal with me and all the otherness I was bringing with my sexuality. And then, you know, and then the first person I bring home is a, a different race, and we live in this lily white suburb, you know. And so they're doing the best they can, right? <laughs> <laughs> Tread and water. <laughs> And, uh, well, I had a Mexican boyfriend before that, so it was, you know, <laughs> the way had been paved. <laughs> and anyway, <laughs> Ooh, am I turning red now? <laughs> so, uh, yes, I am. Yeah, okay, great. And then when I say it, it gets worse. Um, <laughs> anyway, bear with me. Be with me here so I don't feel like an other. <laughs> wow. 
So she would say things like, you know, my mom would say, you know, do you want to go to church with us? And she'd say, oh, Mrs. Powell, all the for sale signs are going to be up for all your neighbors and all the way to church, you know. <laughs> I mean, stuff like that, that, you know, it's, it's funny. And then it's like, oh, not so funny. But it's a way to illumine shadows, you know. And when we laugh, are we not one? I mean, there is no other when we laugh. We are in oneness when we laugh together. And so it's the beauty of those moments of humor and kindness and love that melt it all away, you know? The most poignant experience I probably had with Dawn was when we went to visit some friends in Cincinnati, and we were flying into Louisville first. And our friend said, you got to stop at this diner. It's really fantastic. And we were coming in about breakfast time, and we love a good diner. So we were like, OK, great. And we walk in. And you know, everybody's talking and eating, and there's that click clack sound of plates and forks and knives, and it becomes like, could drop a pin. And everybody watches us walk through the restaurant to get to the table. And it's like, what is going on here? I've never walked into a diner and had that experience before. So I do not know what's going on here, but I'm not OK with it. <laughs> And Dawn says, once we get seated, she's like, uh, let's go. And I'm like, let's go. Oh, no, we are not leaving. And I get on the righteous soapbox of somebody of privilege who has no idea how scary this feeling is. And I say, oh, no, you have every right to be here. We are here. You know, and I thought, well, maybe they think we're a couple, too. You know, I don't know what's going on, but she clearly does. <laughs> she's been down this road many times before. And so there's just this tension you can cut between us in the room, you know, the kind of reticence of the server to come serve us. It's just like everybody's watching everybody, and she is the other in the room. And she, we keep having this under the breath conversation, you know, she's like, let's go. And I'm like, nope, we're not going to leave. <laughs> We're going to squat here, and we're going to have breakfast, and we're going to enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> but when she would say my full name, I knew she meant business. And she did one of those, and one of those, like, you know, where your lips kind of go in, and you get that little grimace. And I, I got it. And I said, I didn't really get it, but I, I got that we were leaving and that, that I needed to comply. Um, and still in the car, I was still kind of on my tirade of how we had a right to be there. Of course we had a right to be there. Of course everybody has a right to go everywhere, right? This was 1992. I mean, I'm not talking 1950. You know, this was, you know, pretty rel contemporary times. But I don't know what it feels like to feel that unsafe when I'm an other. I mean, I do, actually. Maybe not quite that in the same way, but I have had similar experiences. And you probably have, too. And that's the point. We can all access, even though we don't walk in the same shoes, we can all access some kind of time when we have felt scared because we are the other. And we can also access times we have made others other, <laughs> right? We can access the times that we, and we all have privilege of some kind, so we can understand where our privilege is. And when we shine the light upon our privilege, do you know what we do for the world? If we only did that much, if we only said, I will educate myself enough to understand the kind of privilege with which I walk through the world, that humility alone can save lives. I'm not being dramatic. <laughs> can heal what ails us. It's so our willingness to just befriend who and what we don't know and to uncover or recognize some of our privilege. I mean, we're almost all the way back to oneness with those two steps. There's so much we can do to heal the world simply by being the love that we came to be and making a little effort to make bridges across these seeming divides. So Sharif said, you know, in this practice, this is probably the takeaway that we all took in that class that he did with us, that in this practice, you're going to get it wrong. And that's okay. 
you're going to get it wrong. I got it so wrong in that diner. And I still had it wrong in the parking lot. And I probably still had it wrong a day later. But I started to awaken to that truth. And there are going to be times when we just get it wrong. And that's OK. Because you know what we're doing? We're out there. We're making a difference. We're bringing our courageous hearts out into the world. And we're being willing to try, willing to make a difference, willing to heal and to bridge these differences that ail us, these, this shadow of other. And that's all we can ever ask of ourselves, really, isn't it? To try, to do our best. It's really about understanding. You know, we have this 12 spiritual powers in unity, and one of them is understanding, that idea of spiritual understanding, of spirit standing under us, of, of, and that when we stand upon that understanding of oneness, we stand upon truth, we stand upon love. Remember when Lynn manuel Miranda received an award for Hamilton, and he gave this really wonderful, passionate speech, and I just remember the end of it, he said, love is love is love is love is love, and he like couldn't stop saying, love is love. And that's it, right? It's calling upon that great power of love and understanding. That's what really does it for us. Anybody know who Cameron Kasky is? Cameron Kasky is one of um, the, the, the young people, the teenagers from Parkland, who have you know, co-coordinated and created the movement March for Our Lives. And he was one of the, the head kids in this. He basically left school, did school online, and spent you know, and is still doing this work. Um, but he's actually had a change of heart. So in his work, you know, often one of the tools that we have is to say no to whatever it is we think is not working for us. And citizens often have been the spark of the abolition of slavery and the movement of civil rights and the, the movement to get women a vote and the, the Clean and, uh, Air and Water Act. All of that came out of a citizen spark of saying no to one thing and yes to another. So there is some, of course, effectiveness to that kind of approach. But what Cameron has found through his experience with March for Our Lives is there's something else. Because if we keep pushing against each other and just saying, I'm right, you're wrong, you're the other, and you have the, the wrong idea, the immoral idea, and he said we just attack each other's worst arguments. That's what we do. We just go back and forth on the worst of each other's arguments to prove that we're right. Where are we going to go with that? Not very far, right? And so this young man, since the age of 17, has had this major experience and now a transformation. And he's recognizing now that what we really need is common ground. And so now he's going to the so-called other side and having conversations with people about guns. Because he wants to educate himself, and he wants to understand, and he wants to build bridges, and he wants to make a difference. He said, nobody wants kids to die. That's common ground, right? So where do we go from there together? You know, if there is sin, well, there is sin, but what we understand sin to be is just making a mistake, right? Missing the mark. But the greatest of those, if we could say like the deepest mistake we could make, is to believe in separation. Because it is when we believe in separation that we drive all these wedges that create all the, the war and conflict and, and stuff in the world that we don't want to have. So it's coming back to the recognition of oneness, is coming back to the recognition of there I am. When I judge, there I am. When I praise, there I am to see one another as reflections, because that is exactly what we do for each other as we grow, is we hold up a mirror, right? So one day, Brenly comes home and she says, I tailgated myself all the way home. <laughs> it took me a minute. I went, huh? Oh, right. There I am. Yeah. And wouldn't it be great if every day we come home and we say, I loved myself all day long. Because that's really what we've signed up to do, right? To love one another as I have loved you, as Jesus said. And also said, he who is with the, without sin cast the first stone. I mean, this master teacher was a teacher of exactly this. Inclusivity, oneness, love. So all we have to do is just these simple reminders of ourselves to remember what it feels like to be another 
to befriend that which we don't know or who we don't know. And then to just sort of open ourselves up with curiosity, with, with a, a willingness to share, to recognize where we have privilege. Those three things, if we do those three things, befriending what and who we don't know, recognizing our privilege, and, um, and what was the other one? <laughs> and remembering what it feels like to be the other. Those, those three things will really allow us to move into this truth of oneness and away from this belief in separation that is false anyway. So there we are. There we are. We're not just our brothers and sisters keepers. We aren't our brothers and sisters keepers, really, ultimately. I mean, we are in terms of care for one another. But we are our brothers and sisters. We are our neighbors. Let's know that simply together. I think it might be the simplest affirmation I've ever given you, but maybe a tough one to really embody. But let's embody this one together and say it. I am my neighbor, and so it is. <laughs>